I'll start presenting at the same time. Um, yeah. Uh, also, I have to wait for it to do that because what happens is I forget that it's going live and then I hear myself talking to me from the past. So I always have to then mute. There we are. Probably caught that over the top of that. Right. And I can share my screen. And that one. And do the normal, can everybody see my slides? You yes, can see you them. Can. Yes, Good. Yes. Good stuff. That's all right. And the subtitles and everything. So um, before we get going, this is um, an inclusive event and we stand by our code of conduct quite stringently. So if anybody feels as though uh, someone said something or done something that's, that's against our code of conduct, which is basically be nice to people. Uh, then, then get in touch. You can either send me an email at uh, pete at pjgcreations.co.uk or on Twitter at pete underscore codes or send me a chat in here or whichever you feel more comfortable doing, then, then by all means do that. Um, but basically just be nice to everybody. Um, uh, normally at this point, we would be thanking uh, rebel recruiters. And when we go back to in person, we will go back to thanking them. But being as uh, they're not providing us with pizza or a location at the moment, then there's no sponsorship for them to do. But they are still a fantastic um, uh, recruitment agency based in Nottingham. So do go and check them out if you need a job in the area. Um, if you tweet tonight on the hashtag NotsIoT, then one lucky person will win the proverbial JetBrains license. I probably should have tapped Paul up for, for like swag we could have given away, but uh, a bit late for that, and he's on the spot now. You know, uh, get yourself a, a Zoom or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> a Zoom on Zoom. Um, so, uh, tonight we've got uh, Davide Zordan talking about Unity AR and VR for a .NET developer. Uh, and uh, we've got Paul talking about mapping designs from edge to cloud. So they're going to be two fantastic talks for tonight. Coming up uh, next month uh, on the 12th, we often we'll meet either on the second or the third week, just depends on, on what happens. Next month happens to be the second week in November, second Thursday. And we've got Clifford Aguias. He's going to be talking about how he's built a mobile flat, flight simulator. Uh, Clifford, have, we've had him uh, earlier in the year. He built something called Handy. So a robotic arm, 3D printed robotic arm um, for uh, a young disabled lad that he knew. And he can play the Xbox with it and everything. It's a fantastic project. And I think he's speaking at um, .NET Conf um, next month. In fact, that same day, he'll be speaking at .NET Conf about Handy. So uh, I'd recommend you go and watch that. And then Katie Tucker, I met her down at NDC. She's fantastic. She's going to give us an introduction to quantum computing. So be two really, really fascinating talks. And in fact, um, in December, we've got uh, Mohit Boiter, if you've heard of him. Uh, he makes uh, brass rod, uh, really cool looking IoT stuff. I think he's a particle evangelist. Um, and we've also got Catherine Makin, uh, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, apologies if I'm not. And she does amazing um, uh, um, astronomy based artwork. She's, she's amazing. And she does a lot of that uh, with computers, but in, in physical mediums as well. So that's going to be quite cool. Um, at the end of this month, we've got uh, Martin Beebe and Luce Carter coming along to talk about uh, Blazor and uh, Xamarin with Cognitive Services. So that's going to be two fab talks. Uh, Martin is a ex-Microsoft uh, evangelist uh, who went to uh, Oracle and then left Oracle and now he works for AWS. But he concentrates in the .NET space at AWS. So you'll either see him talking about stuff like Blazor or hosting .NET apps on their services and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit uh, sly to have an AWS uh, speaker at a .NET meetup, but um, Martin's awesome. So it'll be well worth coming along to that. Um, I am wearing the T-shirt for a new show that um, I'm going to be doing along with Liam Gulliver and Jonathan Relf uh, on the 27th of October. So it's an hour long, like mini hack uh, that us three are going to do. Uh, it's just going to be basically three grown men searching Stack Overflow for an hour, I think. Uh, but we're going to try and get a GitHub commit um, ticker to, to appear along the bottom of our Twitch stream. Uh, so that's the first thing we're going to do at that. But we're going to be open to suggestions for other things that we can do in an hour. Uh, it's just a bit of fun, really. Think of it as, as like uh, last of the summer wine for, for Azure, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, also, I've started creating some um, Pluralsight courses. I'm just at the very, very early stages. Uh, I asked them earlier if I could shout about this, and I can. So... Uh, there's an exam, AZ220, if you've not um, heard of that. So the Azure Developer Exam. Uh, it's a great exam. Uh, I was involved in creating it. Uh, so with Pluralsight, I'm helping to create um, a learning path to help people pass that exam. 
Uh, chances are I won't get to do all of that because there's a lot in that exam um, and they want it done by Christmas, I think. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're going to be struggling to get it all done, but uh, I'm going to create as much of it as I possibly can. Uh, and I'm also speaking about DevOps and IoT at Brighton Web Dev at the end of the month as well. This is like plugging me. It's not usually like this. I'd like to call out David and Paul, um, but there's quite a lot that uh, that's going on lately and it's all IoT based. So I thought you'd be interested in that. Uh, and then there's the Agile Engineering podcast that uh, me and uh, Jonathan and Liam are involved in as well. So go ahead and check that out. And that's enough about me. Um, we'll switch across and let Davide do his talk. So I'll stop sharing. Um, we'll um, keep everybody on mute, essentially, while the speakers are speaking. Um, but obviously, um, do feel free to stick your questions in um, uh, in the chat. Uh, I'll leave Paul, I've just muted him accidentally. I'll, I'll ask Paul to unmute himself. He can feel free to do that. Um, if there's anything important, then I will go ahead and interrupt if it's convenient. Uh, but other than that, we'll just save it up until we get to the Q&A sections at the end. Uh, some speakers just like to be called out um, and do feel free to say that if you like, but it often just works better if we save it up till the end. And other than that, then, then go ahead. Thank you very much. On to Davide. Yes, thank you, Pete. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak about a topic I'm very passionate about, which is how to write the next generation of uh, user experience, not on the, on, on the 2D space, but on the 3D space, uh, using augmented reality, virtual reality, and the tooling Unity and uh, .NET uh, C Sharp in particular. So I introduce briefly myself. I am David, I'm a senior software engineer. I live in London. I started working with AR, VR technologies around 2017 when I was working with Microsoft. Uh, especially with the HoloLens and the related application for, for customers. And uh, then recently I moved to more consumer friendly devices like uh, Oculus Rift, Oculus Quest or HTC Vive. And uh, in the past I was a Microsoft MVP for five years for my contribution to the community. And uh, I like sharing knowledge on my blog or by uh, presenting to user groups. And uh, I also like collecting badges, you can see from my slide here, slide over here. Uh, let's see the agenda for this evening. I would like to start with a brief introduction to the world of mixed reality. And then we will start immediately to look at how to write mixed reality application using Unity and SteamVR. And after that, I would like to move more from the virtual reality side of things more to the uh, augmented reality world, uh, adding more natural interaction to the experiences via vocal commands or hand tracking that can be found in devices like HoloLens or uh, Oculus Quest recently, and then hand tracking and uh, um, augmented reality applications specifically with a bit of cognitive services. But uh, let's start by introducing the concept of mixed reality, which is often heard about. So mixed reality is the blending of two worlds, the world where we live, which is the, the physical world, and the, the digital world created by a PC or a computer. And I like to refer to this uh, uh, world where the magic happens, because in this uh, mixed reality world, you can really do things and augment your world with uh, holograms or different experiences. You can, for instance, pinpoint some uh, screen in your walls, or you can try a different type of furniture in your room, all that kind of stuff, which is particularly fascinating uh, for me. I think that uh, one concept that well illustrates these types of uh, realities that we can find is well illustrated by this paper uh, by Paul Milgram and Fumio Kishino of uh, 1994. He's speaking about uh, a taxonomy of mixed reality visual displays. It, it is particularly interesting because if we put in the, the, the two extremes, the digital reality, the one generated completely by a, a computer or a machine, and the physical reality where we live every day, if we move through these different steps, we can find all the different types of devices. 
that can generate these experiences. So if we start from the digital reality, we can find this type of displays like the one that I have here, which is the latest Oculus Quest 2 that has been released a couple of days ago. And the particularity of these uh, devices are that they are occluded, so you cannot see through. And uh, in these uh, devices, you need to uh, generate a complete 3D world for the user to be completely immersed. So the experience that you write for digital reality or virtual reality devices is a bit different from the one that you usually uh, write for augmented reality devices like HoloLens. But if we go all through this physical, physical digital reality spectrum, you can find a variety of devices, some virtual reality devices like uh, Oculus Rift or Quest that I just showed, or HTC Vive Cosmos are usually uh, occluded devices. And on the other end, you can find a lot of other ones like HoloLens or Magic Leap Long or Unreal Light or Lynx are one that are sort of a hybrid between uh, immersive headset occluded and uh, a one that you can see through. And this physical digital reality spectrum is a concept particularly uh, enlightened for, for me for uh, when exploring this uh, uh, mixed reality world. Uh, I think during this presentation, we will move from the digital reality development and we will go versus the augmented reality one. So why we mix the reality? This is a question that I usually ask to myself also, why we should invest in mixed reality. So I did some research. And first of all, I think that uh, VR AR is a, a sort of a next competitive platform. Firstly, we were writing application for the 2D world. And I think in the future, we will move more and more on devices that are portable devices that will uh, introduce us to a different computing platform. But from an economic perspective, uh, uh, there, is, uh, there are some studies that estimate a, a big growth in this particular uh, sector. So it is estimated by Goldman Sachs that 80 billion revenue by 2025. But I found a lot of other uh, studies that uh, probably have a higher estimates. And uh, mixed reality is already revolutionizing a lot of uh, different sector processes. Uh, the first one is obviously gaming, because uh, if you think that when you need to generate a virtual reality experience, you need to draw the, the pixels to, on two different screens that are our eyes. And uh, uh, you need a lot of computing power because you need to continuously render these polygons or these environment on the eyes in 90 frames per second, for instance. And uh, uh, it requires a lot of power. So you need a dedicated machine. Usually if someone has invested in a gaming machine is in a better position to start working with the virtual reality. So gaming is uh, clearly one of the sectors when virtual reality is used the most at the moment. But a lot of other sectors are particularly interesting. One is uh, education training, for instance, for training employees on the, on the workplace. Uh, you can imagine an uh, HR uh, department wanting to automate the training of new employees. So virtual reality can be something that can be applied for sure, or in manufacturing for training, uh, manufacturing activities, uh, or real estate for showing how the buildings will work and will appear in the position when in the future will be built. So, uh, and healthcare, healthcare is very important. I recently was studying some application for healthcare and for instance, for doctors interacting with patients and uh, understanding the different uh, uh, interactions or uh, also having uh, a look at their reactions or for, the, for curing phobias and that, all the kind of applications. So uh, I think the, the, the sector where virtual reality, augmented reality can be uh, very varied. So how can we develop for AR, VR? I think when we started to write a virtual reality or augmented reality experience, uh, it's not the same as writing a 2D experience. So the design needs to be careful uh, thought and needs to be careful planned. Uh, I found this concept of uh, illusions that was 
introduced by some papers by Mel Slater of the University of Barcelona, very useful. And uh, this permits to describe a great virtual reality experience if it contains three types of illusion. So the first type is uh, the, the type of place illusion. So you need to provide to the user the uh, illusion to be in a, a different location. So you need to provide uh, a, a proper building if you uh, want to design an experience for virtual reality in terms of uh, um, game, for instance, if you want it to be in a dungeon, you need to be sure that the, the rooms where the user is are of the right scale, otherwise you break the illusion. So the, the place illusion is, is, is very important. The second type is plausibility illusion. Plausibility illusion is a strange term, but it refers to the fact that when you are in a virtual environment, to not lose the, the immersion, the environment, you need to have some agents or have some uh, holograms in the environment that interact with what you are doing. So if you enter a room in virtual reality, you should provide an experience that if there are other uh, entities or virtual person in the environment, they should look at you or interact directly with you. And the third one is the embodiment illusion. So when I was to try trying this embodiment illusion in my first uh, uh, experiences with VR, I was generating a full representation of my body in 3D, and that was not really working well because you immediately were losing the uh, the sensation of being in a virtual environment. And so other applications or implementations like the Oculus one that you see in this, in this particular video how you can easily uh, mimic the hands movement and gesture just by using the, the controllers like this one that are usually included with the six degree of freedom headset. And uh, this is particularly uh, immersive for the user and enable great VR experiences. Let's see in terms of development tools, what we can use. Development tools are mainly in three categories. Game engines like Unity or Unreal Engine 4, which enables the import of assets generated by 3D software like Maya, for instance, and uh, consent, uh, enable the rotation of or physic effects or that kind of stuff to uh, the three objects that has been imported. These are particularly effective for writing virtual experiences because enable to prototype quite quickly and having the, uh, the environment running the headset uh, in, in a matter of minutes sometimes. Some other and more performance way of writing on this type of application are by using directly the APIs like OpenGL or Microsoft DirectX of Vulkan, but clearly this requires a lot of work because just for draw a simple 3D object you require to write a lot of, uh, lot of code. And then uh, uh, clearly it's, they are very good for obtaining the maximum performance, but if you want productivity, you need also to find a balance. And the web VR, WebXR with the frameworks like A-Frame or BabylonJS are particularly good because uh, they consent to use some JavaScript or HTML uh, skill set. And I think in the future, they will be uh, a big part of the development for VR. But since we need to provide the proper performance for VR at the moment, uh, the way to go are game engines or API like uh, Vulkan or DirectX. In terms of languages, C Sharp, .NET for Unity, C++ for Unreal Engine, and clearly JavaScript for web VR. So let's uh, start now and see how we can create a VR experience with uh, Unity. So for creating VR experience, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to be very careful that it is not a 2D experience, but it is a 3D experience. So we need to provide a particular way of interacting with the environment. The first way of interacting with the environment is uh, interaction via motion controller or hand tracking if you are on headset like Oculus Quest or, or, or HoloLens, for instance. And uh, the, the main VR interaction are usually just pointing object and via uh, particular types of rays that can be tracked from the hands, uh, grabbing objects, selecting or moving object in the environment. So this is the first 
a very important type of interaction. And the second very important one is the concept of locomotion. If I have in an environment, I need to be able to move in this environment. And there are several techniques for doing that. Uh, one technique can be if you don't have a controller to just use eye gazing and point to a specific location, they've been teleported there, sort of a Star Trek style way of think, right? Uh, or teleportation via the touch controllers or continuous movement in, in the environment, which sometimes can lead to motion sickness. So needs also to be evaluated on an experience base. So let's start now to create a small application with the Unity and see how we can get started for virtual reality development. So I'll jump quickly to Unity. And you can, in Unity, you can clearly create a new project over there and just go there and find a new project. And you can find a lot of good uh, templates for starting up. I think if you want just to start prototyping the 3D with extras is very good because it contains already some small 3D stuff that you can start manipulating. So when you have uh, created your scene, you have some object in the scene and you need to enable this scene for the virtual reality environment. So this option is available in build settings over there. In build settings, you can find player settings and check these virtual reality supported checkbox. These will enable the scene for virtual reality and to be deployed into a device uh, like Oculus Rift or, or HTC Vive or Quest. It's important also for performance to check this single pass instance that is available only on the desktop version of Unity and uh, to enable the virtual reality SDK. Here you can specify if uh, uh, use OpenVR, which is a standard that is working across different type of headset, both HTC Vive, Oculus, or Windows Mixed Reality headset, for instance. Or if you have a, a dedicated device like Oculus, you can just specify the, uh, the virtual reality device over here. It's worth noting that in Unity 2020, this virtual reality SDK is being deprecated. So if you are starting working with Unity 2020, you want to look at this XR plugin management, which will be in the future also compatible with OpenXR. And uh, it is still in early days, but it is very promising for being able to write application with Unity targeting a variety of headsets. For this example, we will just make use of the old way of writing the apps. So selecting the virtual reality supported in player settings and using the Steam VR plugin that can be imported from the asset store Unity. Once you import the Steam VR plugin, you will find in your project some uh, folders over there with the Steam VR um, mono behavior for Unity and all that is needed for uh, creating assets like players or cameras that are enabled for virtual reality. The most important one on Steam VR is the object called player. If you drag into your scene one object of type player, it will set your scene ready for all the interaction that you will need to in VR. So it will create a camera for both eyes, it will create some Steam VR object, creating a collider for your body, a representation of the left hand and the right hand for the controllers. And really, when you insert a player prefab into your Unity scene, you are already ready to go. Usually, if you press play over here, you can already start uh, playing your scene in the, your headset and having the, the experience. But let's see here how to add the locomotion, first of all. So for adding locomotion, we can, uh, uh, for instance, uh, select the teleporting prefab in SteamVR, drag it to the scene, and you can see here, I have already dragged a teleporting object over there. And this teleporting object contains all the settings for the area where you want to be Tele uh, teleported, which color you want to uh, assign to the area as, and so on. And in terms of uh, props, you can also uh, select uh, uh, for object like the ground, uh, 
specific areas where you want to be teleported. So in this case, I, I just added a teleport area plane and uh, I wanted to enable the user to be teleported to the area if we select with the controller. So I just added a component over here called the teleport area, which is provided by SteamVR. And this will enable the user to be teleported into the area. Another characteristics that I usually find very uh, useful and very enjoyable in VR is the possibility of rotate the player. So if I press the joystick, be able to rotate the player in the, in the area so I can look around. Uh, in the first experience, I was not using that one. It was a bit breaking the immersion. So it's particularly uh, useful and something that uh, in my experience should be uh, created. So for doing this, uh, let's see an example of code. If we associate the mono behavior to the player, we can just uh, interact with the different uh, uh, Steam VR input sources that are the left and the right controller. And if we set the, uh, the tolerance for the Menura set in order to optimize the experience with some parameters, and we check if uh, it's minus of the joystick tolerance or greater than the joystick tolerance, we can then trigger joystick left or joystick right actions that will have to trigger rotation on the player, which in Unity can simply be done by calling the rotate method in the game object.transform. So in this, in this way, I am just doing joystick right and I'm rotating on the right for with the rotation angle and on the left with the other rotation angle. So uh, this is one. So this is quite simple and can be easily implemented uh, by Unity uh, and, and associated to the player. So the teleporting can be associated to the uh, to, the, to the reporting area. And let's see how to add interaction now. So usually if you want to interact with the object over here, so let's see this hat for instance. So this hat can be easily uh, enabled for an interaction via the interactable script over there. This is another script which is included in Steam VR. So you can just include the script. And uh, if you wanted to apply additional transformations like throwing uh, the object in your scene, you can also associate the throwable one. The throwable one. And uh, once you have done that, you're pretty much ready for start uh, experiencing your scene in VR. So let's jump to a short video on the presentation over there. I'll run in a video because it's easy when you do presentation with the virtual reality devices to give motion sickness to the audience. So it's often a good idea to record video. You can see here, this is the scene which is running on a Windows Mixed Reality headset. You see here the effect of a rotating, of the rotate script that we just uh, analyzed and the teleport that can be uh, enabled using the, uh, the joystick on the controller. And if we move more, you can see that I am moving around the area that I created before with the teleport area object. And I can also move near the table over there and select the object with my controller and manipulate also the object. So. It's a, it, I think it's very cool because uh, you can really get started with VR development in a few minutes by setting up a scene, importing the Steam VR plugin and setting up a teleport area and then adding the interac interaction with the, the interactable script. Uh, that's pretty cool. But l l let's see how to add more powerful interaction to our scene. And this more powerful interaction are the natural one. Uh, if you don't have to use controllers, you don't have to teach your user how to use the experience, it's, it's always better. So when I was experimenting with my first virtual reality experiences, I was looking at the ways for adding voice recognition to, to Unity. And I found two very useful way. The first one is using the Unity keyword recognizer, which is if you don't need clearly to uh, recognize natural language understanding of that kind of stuff. So if you have simple phrases, you can easily use the keyword recognizer. But if you want to provide an experience 
very, very close to the spoken language, you need to use services like Lewis from Azure and the natural language understanding. So let's see how to use the keyword recognizer. In Unity, you can easily create a new object of type keyword recognizer if you pass an array of strings that represents the word that you want to be recognized an event will be triggered called on phrase recognized and in this event you can verify which word has been recognized and do several actions in this example for instance i am activating a frame per second ui which is showing me how the application is performing while I'm running, which is particularly useful because you need to check performance very often when you write virtual reality apps. So in this way, if I find that one of the world was part of the array that was uh, sending the constructor, I can just set the, the frame per second UI as active, true or false. But if you want to create a natural language understanding experience, you need to take advantage of the intelligent cloud. And then you can, create a, an application in Azure, like a, a natural language understanding app. Uh, you can connect to the portal, create your language understanding app, and then get the input from the Microsoft from microphone and get the phrase from the string, send the string to a REST service in Azure, and then capture the intent that can also predefine in the apps using some predefined entities like this. In this example, I tried to create an experience that was reacting a, a request from a help from the user. And so when the user is say, help me, or can someone help me, or to what should I do, et cetera, the network, the natural language understanding of Azure can identify if you have said one of these intents and via a dictation recognizer that you can instantiate in Unity, you can capture the audio. And when you have captured the audio, you can uh, capture the string from your audio and with a particular confidence and send this request using a Unity web request, which is an HTTP call to your uh, natural language understanding service and receive a JSON from this request. And from this JSON, if the scoring intent is particularly uh, elevated. So it means that uh, you, your intent has been recognized as valid. In this case, I decided to apply uh, a top scoring intent dot score, which is if uh, the uh, probability of the, in, the intent to, be, to have been recognized is 65%, then uh, it means that it's quite good, right? And then I can, be quite sure that this is what the user what, what was trying to say. And you, I can also in this way, apply a show a help message or something like that. So it, it's particularly uh, simple to set up and uh, can be easily integrated in experiences for virtual reality or simple games. So, just to try out this, I wanted to see if by applying interaction and locomotion, I was able to write a small game, right? And you can see I, I got this environment from the Unity store, the mysterious dungeon. I am applying can you help me? locomotion and I can ask for help, which is using the keyboard recognizer as just illustrated or Louis, if you prefer and then you can interact with some objects and uh, move in the environment. In this case, I just decided to explore this one and move over there. Okay, I found the key and then I can hopefully open the door and uh, move over there, collect uh, some collectibles and uh, continue with my small game. What it is particularly important for me to highlight is that uh, this small can you help experience me? can be simply created by the concept that we saw before. Show me the score. Interaction using SteamVR, locomotion using SteamVR, and a bit of uh, natural understanding via voice. 
etc etc so you can see here i added something just to have fun so i can grab something i can kill the skeleton and all the fun stuff here we go and uh, so when i started creating this experience i found immediately some uh, uh, issues with motion sickness because uh, if you are not very careful in uh, creating your uh, Unity app, uh, you, it's easy to give to the user motion sickness in VR. And uh, if you're giving motion sickness to, to users, you're really not having a use base for your application. So this is very, very important. So some performance tips that I found while writing virtual reality application is the first one is if you have an object which is not moving, just mark it as static. This is quite important for helping the batch of the polygons when they are rendered on the, on the, on the two different uh, uh, screens or the single different screen, depending on the headset. And uh, I found useful this, this script uh, for finding if in a scene there are objects that are not marked as static. And, uh, uh, this is particularly a good one when uh, you are debugging on or verifying if the performance are uh, adequate. And the other very, very important one is to use baked light. If uh, you're using real time lights in Unity for VR, that's very bad for performance. And uh, just uh, uh, as a recommendation, try to use baked lights uh, because these will create a mapping of the lights already during the build process and baking lights during the design time, which will save a lot of computation power during the, uh, the run of your experience. And the third one, which is uh, very important also this one is uh, avoid uh, very expensive method for performance during runtime. So there is a method in, Un in Unity behavior, which is the update method which is executed for every frame. So if you're doing operations like get component in the update method, that's very bad for performance. So it's bad, good practice to cache the strings like I did in this mono behavior, and then instantiate the, the component, the unity component in the awake method, and then and store it in a private variable, and then use this, uh, this private variable for uh, reference it to the component at runtime. This will have a, a huge performance improvement on Unity app apps. And uh, let's start now to move from the virtual reality side of things. Uh, we already introduced a bit of uh, a natural language understanding using first the keyword recognize and then the uh, Lewis services. But when we move versus and then towards the uh, the augmented reality experiences, we, uh, we want to provide uh, some additional functionalities like uh, the capability of implement uh, hand tracking. And uh, for implementing hand tracking and uh, having a device that supports uh, the tracking is uh, sort of fundamental, you can uh, use uh, the fantastic HoloLens device for hand tracking. HoloLens 2 has a fantastic implementation for hand tracking, eye tracking. But if you want to experiment with uh, cheaper devices, you can do by uh, buying an Oculus Quest, for instance. Oculus Quest provided this capability of hand tracking. And uh, Oculus Quest 2 also is much more performant. So this is also optimized. And uh, if you link Oculus Quest with uh, a good toolkit, like the mixed reality toolkit for Unity that was already designed for HoloLens, but clearly supports all the devices on the OpenVR standard. And uh, recently in the version 2.5, which has been released a, a couple of weeks ago, also supports hand tracking for Oculus Quest. You can start creating these experiences, very advanced experience with hand tracking, which doesn't only support the tracking of the fingers, but also important manipulations uh, uh, like the gesture recognizer. So I did here a small demo, which was using the default toolkit samples that are available with the mixed reality toolkit. And you can see probably it's not a very good idea to play a piano in virtual reality, but you can see the, the potential here. You can just go and uh, play an instrument because you have uh, end and finger tracking. You can uh, interact with sliders and uh, also you have uh, these 
fantastic interactions. I can think if you wanted to write an experience for uh, uh, examining some uh, motors or uh, any other type of object, you can just put in your environment and apply two hands manipulation like this, explore this in, uh, in detail. So Mixed Reality Toolkit, uh, Quest, HoloLens 2 uh, enables all these kind of uh, experiences, which is particularly cool. And, and here we are moving from the virtual reality world to the augmented reality world, because when we start interacting with the, the environment, for instance, the Oculus Quest has some capabilities for seeing through that they are not yet enabled for developers, but uh, they, they are there. And, when we enable these see-through capabilities, uh, we start interacting with different uh, types of applications from the virtual reality ones. Usually augmented reality uh, experiences are uh, uh, not completely occluded, means that you don't need to design a full virtual world in it, uh, but you need just to augment the world. And so when I was uh, having access to a HoloLens when I was working Microsoft, I, I decided to, to do the hello world for augmented reality. That, that is recognizing objects using uh, cognitive services. And then uh, uh, taking advantages of all the sensors available in the HoloLens device. Sensors that include not only cameras, but depth camera, uh, eye tracking sensors, or um, hand tracking sensors. Uh, these will enable all uh, a new category of virtual experience. I, I can think when we will be able to miniaturize these components and having some glasses like these that have all these capability, that will be amazing because uh, we, will, we will sort of use the devices in a completely different way from now. So from doing uh, an application that was testing the computer vision capabilities in uh, uh, in HoloLens, I just created a computer visual endpoint in cognitive services. And then to test this cognitive service endpoint, I created a small UWP app. And this UWP app was just using a NuGet package, and which is in the background using uh, HTTP REST call to the cognitive services. Uh, and uh, in this case, I'm just grabbing a picture from the camera and storing the picture locally and send the picture, the JPEG over the wire using HTTP and then receiving back a JSON. This was an example that I did at Microsoft at the quarter in Reading and I was doing a, a simple photos of uh, the building and then sending this photo and see how it is accurate in recognizing that it is an outdoor building and that there is some snow, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I developed this first application for UWP, then I decided to get the DLL that I created for UWP and use it on HoloLens. So I created my Unity experience and imported the Mixed Reality Toolkit that uh, in the first version was called the Holo Toolkit, uh, but the functionalities uh, were clearly not comparable with the ones that we have uh, nowadays for HoloLens 2, but we're already providing a very good starting point. And I put a status text, it was uh, uh, triggering the recognize of the image via the camera through voice. And when I was- Analyze. Analyzing picture, a flat, a flat screen television. So I triggered uh, a simple, uh, camera shop using the HoloLens and then using this cognitive services library I sent back the image to the cognitive services service, received back the JSON and then captured the JSON and recognized that it was in this case a flat screen television. And this is only the starting point because the new mixed reality services available in Azure enables a new category of experiences for instance, uh, remote rendering, which has been released recently, enables to run very high polygon scenes on mobile devices. So if you think a mobile device like Quest can handle probably a maximum of 200,000, 300,000 polygons, while a virtual reality desktop headset like Oculus Rift or HTC Vive can handle a one or 
couple of millions polygon, some scenes like uh, a high reality uh, representation for photogrammetry, for instance, could easily reach 50 millions, 100 millions or 150 millions polygons. In that case, you can't really run that scene on, on your device. So uh, a, a good way of uh, doing that is via services like remote rendering or uh, Unreal Pixel Streaming. And uh, via a, a proprietary protocol, the, uh, you can remote render all the polygons that are generated in the cloud and rendered and then sent to the, to the device or services like special anchors where you can use machine learning or cognitive vision services for placing objects in the environment and uh, pin those objects in the environment and leave it them over there. Or object anchors that can be associated to object in movement directly in the environment. So the range of services that can enable the creation of uh, a uh, really compelling experience is very rich at the moment. So to summarize what we saw during this uh, presentation, we started by introducing the concept of Windows mixed, re of mixed Reality, and then we moved how to develop application for VR, in particular using the Steam VR plugin and uh, the interaction and locomotion techniques. And now we started moving versus uh, towards the uh, augmented reality experiences by introducing vocal commands and uh, uh, some performance tips for optimizing the experience and uh, hand tracking and uh, some uh, HoloLens uh, specific applications. And my key takeaways for when working with this technology are performance is very, very important and uh, you need to check this performance early and often to avoid motion sickness. So. As soon as possible, you try the experience on the emulator, try your application soon. And you can use the emulator for, or the simulator for basic development, but then you need to try it immediately. And also to try and get the illusion for the user. So test frequently on devices, ensure that the illusions for virtual reality that we mentioned previously are already part of the design of your experience. So the place illusion, the plausibility illusion uh, and the embodiment illusion are fundamental for providing great VR experience. And if you want to take your experience to the next level, use cloud services like speech, vision or anchors that are easily available now on platform like Azure. And to finish, I would uh, like to mention this quote from Arthur C. Clarke, Profile of the Future, that any sufficiently advanced technology is undistinguishable from magic because when you try this stuff, it's real magic. Thank you very much. And uh, you can find the slide on my website and uh, I'm here for any question. That was fantastic. Um, I've just changed my microphone, so I don't know if you can all hear me. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, good. Uh, I'll change it again in a minute. Um, yeah, so any questions for, for Davide? One thing that struck me, struck me, Davide, you talked about motion sickness and what have you. Yeah. What about things like epilepsy and what have you, the, the, the different things between mixed reality, augmented reality? Has there any been research into those sort of things with things uh, like... Uh, epilepsy and, and other things where there's sensitivities to light and motion and yes there have been a lot of a lot of studies about uh, about it i am not uh, uh, not to my knowledge now i don't have anything particular in mind but the concept of motion sickness especially for uh, different type of uh, uh, pathologies in healthcare is uh, something that is really mm. Uh, consider very importantly from from a researcher. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Hi, David. Um, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Uh, just just wanted to get your take on um, more augmented reality. Yeah. And the remote rendering. Um, yes. Because uh, you know, five G is becoming more accessible now. 
yeah. as a lower latency transport mechanism. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to get your your view on, or, or maybe some ideas of, of applications that you could maybe use with a mobile device, which is accessible to people. You know, they get they, you know, especially with things like the iPhone 12 launch and better camera technology in in the handset. Yeah, the and coupling that with remote rendering. Cetera. Yeah, I think the uh, the sky is the limit for this for these kind of applications <laughs> because really now uh, I think uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, when I was starting to look at these technologies, it was clearly a limitations because when you were starting doing also small games with virtual reality desktop, you, it, it's, very, it's very easy to reach the limitation of one or two million polygons. It's, it's, very, it's very easy. So if you think uh, um, uh, application for photogrammetry, for instance, or if you wanted to put some buildings in, uh, in the context of the real world and they can easily go uh, to uh, 50, 100 million polygons. So I think technologies like uh, remote rendering uh, are uh, something that will be much more uh, considered for augmented and virtual reality applications because they open a completely new uh, sector application I can think about it, apart from application from uh, uh, that I just mentioned related to photogrammetry, et cetera, but uh, any kind uh, uh, of uh, real detailed object that you want to study like motors, et cetera. Uh, there was a, uh, an application for Unreal Engine that was illustrating pixel streaming for space exploration that was impressive, you know, HoloLens. And uh, um, I think in the future, uh, especially with the 5G and the low latency that we provide, it is something that will be for sure uh, enabled and uh, will consent a lot of uh, uh, fantastic application in the future. Um, yeah, I think it's something that uh, uh, I, when I was presenting about this topic in the last months, I in every uh, presentation that I gave, I got at the end uh, some question about the remote rendering. <laughs> and uh, so it, it is something that it is, will, it will be big in my opinion in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Awesome. How much of that? Uh, I've got a Gear VR here, which is like kids' toys compared to the stuff that, that you've been showing there. But how much of it applies? Obviously, you're missing decent controllers and stuff like that. But so I think the Gear VR was the first generation of uh, headsets that, you know, you were just having this headset, you were using your mobile phone, you really said that it was usually overheating because <laughs> your phone was really becoming very hot. And uh, what was, I think, the starting point of uh, uh, the virtual reality experiences that now devices like Quest are able to provide. So you see all the evolution, for instance, Oculus, you see the initial uh, Gear VR, and then it became Oculus Go. So they just, they, they just removed the, the, the phone right from all the, the problems that it could have, and they embedded the phone, but it was still a, a three degree of freedom. So you do, didn't have a positional tracking. And then uh, they released Oculus Quest, and then uh, Oculus Quest 2 now. And, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, development uh, frameworks, you could just use the, the same stuff. Uh, you have clearly an evolution of the frameworks now on Oculus for uh, six degree of freedom, all that kind of uh, stuff, but uh, yeah. Awesome. I think I made a little cube in space and I got that to work on my Gear VR. Um, and then I started watching tutorials and realized that it really could suck you in for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot cool. of fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, did the tutorial, there's a, um, uh, like a, a first person shooter, not, not AR, VR, but the, the Unity first person shooter tutorial as well. And, oh, this is dead cool. And then you look at the time and, oh, no, I need to get to bed. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. Like it. Definitely. And there are very good tutorials on the, I think Microsoft's fantastic tutorial on their site for getting started with mixed reality development and uh, Oculus has uh, some other fantastic tutorials. I think they are to take into consideration. 
Yeah, I just had to turf the cat out. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> anyway, any other questions for Davide? If you don't have any question now, just uh, ping me over Twitter or any other social media channel. <laughs> I usually try to reply. I have a question. What, yes. What would you say, like, in today's world, what is the biggest obstacle of seeing this more mainstream in everyday industries? Like, you, you know, from what I've seen, it's very specific to yeah. you know, science or healthcare. Um, yeah. Yeah. What are the biggest, biggest ob obstacles that would actually, um, that are preventing uh, it from being more mainstream where you would see it in every day in retail or in, uh, gen in general yeah. industry? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question because uh, I think it is something that uh, every passionate in this area is is thinking about, right? And I think uh, if you see our dev devices like Hololens, uh, uh, clearly they are expensive. They have uh, a small field of view, and uh, uh, they are not uh, really consumer devices yet. Uh, so you need to have a lot of uh, lot of stuff in place. It's not only one particular uh, uh, characteristic of the device. You need to have the price. You need to have uh, uh, the, the the quality of the displays. You need to have a good battery life. You need to have uh, a very good field of view. They must be comfortable. They must not give uh, motion sickness. Uh, so. Uh, there are a lot of obstacles at the moment and think uh, uh, devices like Quest are a very good example of uh, reaching the consumer market. And, uh, and so they are trying to lower as much as possible the price, you know. So the latest one is $299 uh, or uh, pounds, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so really it's uh, started to be affordable now. And, uh, and clearly content content because uh, we were talking before or other type of devices that didn't have content right. in the past, right? And uh, content is fundamental. If you don't have content, it must be very good content, very good content. Otherwise people just don't use it. Right, okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. What have you done? I saw all the Azure stuff that you've done in there as well. Um, and that was that was mega cool. Uh, have, you, have you tried? sort of interacting with the real world while you're in VR, because that's always something from an IoT geek's point of view that I've wanted to do. And obviously you see it from things like Minecraft and stuff are able to, to turn LEDs and switches yeah. and able to control stuff in the VR world. Is that something you've tried or? I, I tried briefly with the HoloLens, the, with the object recognizer that I showed before. So I was able to recognize object. And clearly you could recognize, recognize object and also trigger some, some other stuff. And I, I think if you have devices like uh, the HoloLens one, you have additional capabilities that you don't have in devices like Oculus or, or uh, H H HTC Vive, for instance, like uh, um, be able to do spatial mapping or spatial understanding that you can do that now also on iPhones clearly or iPad with the LiDAR technologies. And then I think in that particular case, you, you open a new world, right? Because when you start and you are able to recognize objects, recognize environment, you can start to really interact with the environment. And I don't know, switching on a light, putting a slider for uh, the temperature, all that kind of stuff, you know. So that's uh, that's pretty amazing. But you needed to have the capability at least to see through, uh, which is which is missing from the consumer devices now. Yeah, I know there's the the MR headsets as well that have got an idea of the outside world uh, that sort of bridge that gap between a hollow lens and a, a fully immersive VR system. Um, yeah, there is the Varjo one, which is quite quite expensive. It's not really a consumer device. It is uh, more for, for enterprises, but that, that's very powerful because you can, with, the, with that device, you can also substitute uh, monitors or screens directly into, into the headset. Having see-through capabilities, uh, very high polygon also experiences. So that, that, that's a pretty cool one, but right. still not a consumer one. Have you played uh, with the HoloLens 2 or is it, was it just the original? Yes, or... yes, I did the stuff with the HoloLens 2. I went to the, to the Mixed Reality Summit in Redmond the last year. And so <laughs> I had a, a very quick preview of the HoloLens 2. I was really amazed from the device, you know, because uh, the hand, I think uh, the hand tracking is uh, 
amazing. It's a sí. sort of uh, uh, another planet, and uh, you can easily rec- do all these type of natural lang- natural interaction in the environment. You and uh, all the uh, capabilities uh, available in the mixed reality toolkit for uh, interacting with buttons or menus or uh, the, the two hands pinch and zoom stuff are something that always amazed me, you know, and uh, yeah, HoloLens 2 is fantastic. Is uh, you know, I think it's uh, recognized as probably one of the better, the, um, yeah, the better devices in the, in the market at the moment. Yeah. Have they increased the viewport on the, on the HoloLens 2 as well, I think, a little bit? Yes, yeah. yes, there is a small increase in the, in the, in the field of view, which is very welcome. But then you also, the, the part of the comfort is very important in HoloLens 2 because HoloLens 1 was a bit uh, heavy, you know, and then it was a bit uncomf- uncomfortable sometimes. And when you wear the HoloLens 2 is very well balanced. And so you have an uh, uh, increasing field of view. You have a very, very well balanced device, good battery life and, uh, and hand tracking, eye tracking that are amazing. and. Uh, uh, I think just for hand tracking and A tracking is the characteristics that is worth for, for getting the HoloLens because it opens a new a new way of capabilities. You've not got a uh, HoloLens 2 in those drawers behind you there, Paul. <laughs> just just the HoloLens 1 uh, on this side of the room. Uh, Have you really? Yes. And um, yes. if, if you tweet oh, I, on the hash, hashtag NotsIoT. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not for everybody, but yes, we do uh, uh, occasionally have, have fun with some of this. And, and uh, as David was mentioning, there's, you know, there's definitely crossover here with spatial computing and uh, yeah, IoT. Definitely. definitely. You, can uh, do, you can do pretty much everything, I think, yeah. Mega cool. I'd love to, yeah, I, I just wish I had more time to be able to delve into that. I will eventually get more time and delve into that. But um, now it's fantastic. Is there any other questions? Because I've just got all of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody um, had a chance to play with any AR, VR stuff or even Unity? Um, I'm guessing that perhaps Paul has. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I've got a, um, I've got a very early Oculus Rift developer kit too. Ah, the, the DK2, yeah. The, yeah. the one with the really chunky cable that pulls yeah, your head back, yeah. you know? So <laughs> so uh, it's not like the consumer edition because, um, you know, there's a cost to these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, uh, I've used I've used Unity. Uh, I've, I've, um, I've been researching Unreal um, because of, of some of the, uh, some, some of the enhancements about doing, um, better visualizations, like it's starting to be used more yeah. in media, for example. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was exploring the idea of, could you use that to enhance the communication experience at home? You know, can you, oh, uh, nice. can nice. you, you know, given that you, uh, well, that, that's, that's one of the reasons, but also looking uh, as an idea, it's not my day job, but looking as an idea, um, now that you've got things like Microsoft Grid, um, you know, Web, WebEx on Cisco, you've got the, the yeah. WebEx Teams yeah. API, um, could you bring more in uh, through their API, more in uh, via a conference experience into VR or AR, uh, yeah. and enhance that whole experience? Um, which I know I know people are playing around with. There's some videos on the internet of people playing around with that kind of thing. So uh, I was, I'm just wondering, um, you know, where, when does it go beyond a toy to something more consumable and normal? You know, especially now that we're all at home and we're all a bit disconnected, yeah. is there a way of getting a bit more connected? Yeah, through yeah. the use of these tools. I don't know, but it's an idea. But didn't the Tory conference run a VR event? Oh, dear. <laughs> I think I saw it on I've Got News For You. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, no. I think recently on the Facebook Connect conference, uh, when they presented the, the Oculus Quest 2, they also presented the new Facebook uh, project uh, for augmented reality that will, they said that they should release something next year don't know uh, but uh, in that particular conference they mentioned uh, some uh, api that uh, sdk that uh, they are developing for 
these experiences that you are mentioning now of collaboration. So it uh, seems like in, starting from next year, there will be some SDK for enabling developers to take advantage of uh, these augmented reality experiences using Oculus Quest. And then, uh, then we open um, a, a new level of uh, you know, communication also. Think about virtual meetings or uh, all that kind of stuff. Especially in, the, in this period, uh, is something that we should consider probably. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the the whole thing about remote rendering uh, can actually make it uh, conceivable that a consumer device can give you a better experience. You know, you don't need to have yeah. um, you know yeah. a supercharged PC to drive it at home if you can render remotely. So um, that that I think yeah. could really open the door. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Also, devices like HoloLens are mobile devices, so you cannot uh, render millions of polygons in a HoloLens, you know, 200, 300,000 maximum. And then the remote rendering for this scenario is the probably only way to go. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> fascinating, yes, definitely. Paul, have you, did you have much chance to, to build stuff with the HoloLens? So I've, I've messed with it a couple of, of ways. Um, one that was, that was more, I guess, for play, um, in case anyone doesn't know. I mean, I, I really like the classic video games. And uh, a developer from Washington, D.C. had reached out to me with a build of um, an, an NES, Nintendo Entertainment System emulator, that worked in, um, you know, was able to run essentially on the HoloLens. And the trick there that we kind of worked on together was, extracting the pixels into voxels so that would like render in three dimensions. Uh, it doesn't work for all games. There's a certain class of, of char ROMs that it works for. And then wired that up to controllers so you could actually like, imagine you're playing Mario. And, and this is weird because I don't think the developers intended this, but like you can look inside the pipe and you can see the plant monsters coming up. And I mean, there's videos of this online. Um, and then one of the ones I think that was a bit more on the serious end, again, probably more play, but I could see this actually being useful, was marrying it up with the in, NVIDIA Jetson Xavier device that was doing sort of what y'all were mentioning, the off-site processing, yeah, where it would take yeah. the, Holo, the HoloLens camera feed and then like, like Terminator 2, it actually starts identifying objects. Yeah. They'll start looking around the room and they'll start counting oranges and apples and things like that. Um, so I don't know that I've done anything useful, but um, certainly some 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 playing around with the device, and it's it's it could certainly be a game changer again if we can get over some of the limitations that are present with it now, cost, battery life, and uh, onboard processing abilities. Yeah, I found a very uh, interesting Hololens do these uh, additional AI processor that is available, you know, because then you can start doing that kind of. Uh, computation on the device for real-time object recognition, that kind of stuff, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Did you see the, um, there was a, a pop of VR, um, what was it? it? Might have been AR actually, it was, it was AR, where, people, where you could play Mario in 3D. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, so that, yeah. You know, that was dead cool, that was. I mean, you could hit blocks, couldn't you? And, and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're like, put it in the world and like, you're the Mario, you're, yeah. you're jumping. Yeah, it was yeah. something like that. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> Let's see if I can find the video. <laughs> Again, this is what, what we do. We're given this technology. These are the things we have to build first. And then we, we find the, yes. that winning use case for everybody. It's coming. Exactly. I think this is it. Oh, this is a big, long video. But, uh, hold on a minute. Yeah. Oh, this is dead cool. Yeah. Assuming this is the one, I will share it. Yeah. yeah, another application that I found fascinating when I was playing with the HoloLens, I remember I was in writing. And uh, uh, I, re I remember it was released, uh, just released the bot framework. So these interactions between, you know, with the, uh, with the HoloLens, with, with the virtual bot and using natural language understanding and the voice. That's another area which, which is fascinating me in some way. And I think uh, it can be linked to collaboration in some way. And yeah, but then yeah, you can do pretty much everything. 
Too many screens. Can you see that? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Oh, I've got, to, I've got to get me one of these. Yeah, how cool is that? <laughs> it's very cool. I think this is the one I saw. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, surely this, this was amazing, isn't it? What are the, what the people thought they were walking around him? I don't know. But is it Hollowlands? <laughs> I think it is, isn't it? Is it? You, you, you just solved. You, you just solved the answer, answer to how do I how get, my get my kids, kids off the, the Xbox, Xbox and outside? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's just awesome. So anyway, that's, so you can go and find that. I'll put the link in the chat um, for people. But yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, there we go. Cool. Uh, so we're, I'm, I'm conscious now that we were at 10 past eight. So it's probably a good time at this point now to switch across to Paul. Um, normally, I've, I've completely lost track of time, actually. I'd be saying go and get yourself a drink and, and go for a wee, but uh, you're going to have to do that while Paul's speaking uh, or, you know, just just tough it up and, and sit down and watch. Uh, so, yeah, with that, uh, we'll we'll switch across to Paul. <laughs> all right and let me just let me know if y'all are able to see screen here um just trying to bring everything up here cool let's see yep we yep. see sharing perfect perfect cool so um this presentation is actually pretty Interesting in that there's a few meta things I'd like to, to kind of share with you before we get started with. Uh, number one, this, this presentation I'm going to give is really an introduction to a larger presentation that exists online uh, that is pre-recorded if you did want to dive into uh, some more deeper details in terms of the uh, concepts we'll cover here. And the entire set of content that uh, that this belongs to is also available and is going to cover a lot of different topics related to um, IoT solutioning in Microsoft Azure. Now, um, my hope here is that as you're kind of watching through this content, um, you're learning stuff. But at the same time, I do want to mention that there is more out there. We'll sort of link to all of those resources um, at the end of the session. Now. We don't have a whole lot of time here, but in the short time that we have, we're going to cover quite a few interesting things that relate to uh, designing solutions and mapping best practices from edge to cloud. So uh, before we get started, just a quick introduction for myself. Um, again, I'm glad to be here with uh, all you fine folks in some of you in Nottingham, and I understand that a lot of you are uh, visiting virtually from places all around the world. It's a big pleasure to be here with everyone. And uh, my name is Paul DiCarlo. I'm actually based out of Houston, Texas. I'm a principal cloud advocate on our uh, IoT advocacy team within developer relations at Microsoft. And I'm always talking about things related to IoT. So if you'd like to, you know, throw questions about things you might be working on, um, you know, just general talk or even sharing the next cool thing that you've seen, you can find me online at PJ DiCarlo. So again, uh, there's going to be a few different topics we're going to cover through um, in a short period of time. So this is this is going to be a bit uh, lofty, but in our limited time, we will cover strategies for secure IoT device connectivity in real world environments. We'll then look at how a common IoT solution architecture can be adapted to a variety of business verticals, essentially uh, showcasing various different ways, in fact, that IoT could be leveraged in various different lines of business. And then finally, we will somehow fit in techniques for implementing an artificial intelligence at the edge solution that supports um, intelligent video analytics and processing that in real time utilizing AI at the edge. So let's go ahead and get started. And we'll begin with that first topic, which is really the elephant in the room when it comes to Internet of Things solutions. And, and, and that is, of course, security. And it's a big concern because when you think about IoT solutions in the real world, they're often devices that are accessible in public areas that might be doing mission critical stuff. And so as you might expect, security in IoT solutions is 
of course, begins at the device layer, but also must be taken into consideration in the communication layer and perhaps within a cloud hosting environment if one is employed in a solution. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick look at how Microsoft provides security for IoT solutions in these particular areas. So security concerns as they relate to IoT is, is of course, a very real thing. In fact, in our last uh, US presidential election around uh, October 2016, there was the Mirai botnet attack in which roughly 100,000 IoT devices were taken over by hackers and turned into an act of botnet. And that botnet was then used to launch a distributed denial of service attack the immediate impact of which was that it knocked off the East Coast of the United States from the internet for an entire day. So you can sort of think about uh, you know, the effects of that, no Netflix, no chatting, no online shopping, nothing for an entire sizable portion of the United States. Now imagine that you have hackers gaining access to your corporate data by way of say a fish tank. It, this, this might sound a bit unbelievable, but Similarly, around the same time, um, this happened to a big casino in Las Vegas where attackers used a vulnerability in an aquarium thermometer to get a foothold into the casino's network. And of course, once they were inside, the first thing that they did was they looked up the casino's high roller database, pulled that down and attempted to use that to their advantage. But it's not just these types of things that are susceptible to these attacks. Industrial systems are also potential targets and there was a recent attack dubbed the Triton malware attack in which hackers attempted to manipulate layers of built-in emergency shutdown protocols to keep plant systems running while they were boring deeper and deeper, gaining more control along the way. And this is kind of concerning if you think about it, like if malware can defeat a plant safety shutdown features, then it could work to sabotage that system in countless ways, potentially catastrophic. Now, thankfully, in this attack, the malware did eventually trigger an emergency shutdown system that allowed it to be noticed and mitigated by the on-site IT stack. So as you've seen in those examples, security in IoT solutions is paramount. And of course, this is the result of the fact that IoT typically implies the presence of devices, often with access to mission-critical controls, sensor data, maybe even access to real-time video and computer vision-based AI at the edge scenarios. So securing IoT solutions requires mitigation really across all of those relevant data pathways, beginning with the device itself, its communication layer to both internal and external services. And this could typically involve a connection to a cloud hosted environment. And in those situations, of course, the cloud hosted environment itself. And one of the things that Microsoft IoT services tried to, to enforce really just by design is taking into account all of those layers within the IoT solution to provide you secure connectivity from the device, its pathway to the cloud, and of course, within the cloud itself. So how this is accomplished is that whether you're employing an IoT Edge-based solution or perhaps utilizing Microsoft hardware, for example, the Azure Sphere microcontroller, um, something that we dubbed the Azure IoT security architecture is baked into all of those components that allows you to monitor again, beginning from the device level to be able to provide you dashboards for monitoring the security state of your solution within something that we call the Azure Security Center. And the way this works is that this integration is built directly into the Azure IoT Device Connectivity SDKs. Um, in the situation where you're using Azure IoT Edge, the runtime itself has those baked in. And in the case of Azure Sphere hardware, it's actually baked into the silicon itself running on the device. So, Hopefully the messaging here is that uh, due to these sort of safeguards that we've taken in the IoT uh, SDKs and all of the services built within Microsoft Azure that back that, you can trust that building your solutions with Microsoft IoT device SDKs, services and hardware, essentially means that security integration is available to your solution right from the start. And of course, that final piece, Within the Azure cloud itself, you can rely on security and disaster recovery options available in each of the 60 global data centers that are currently available and those are constantly growing, of which this availability assures you that no matter where your devices are in the world, you can expect low latency connectivity and throughput with the ability to enable multi-region failover protection to ensure your IoT solutions are always up and running. And of course, any security teams that you might have employed across your organization can also benefit 
from the protection that Microsoft Azure employs itself across its own data centers. And of course, if your solution requires industry compliance standards, Microsoft Azure is ready to welcome you with an updated selection of 93 currently available compliance offerings to help you meet those standards. Now, in the follow-up presentation that we'll link off to in the end, uh, we'll go into a bit more detail on these approaches that can allow you to adapt Azure IoT solutions to really accommodate various often tricky network environments in a secure manner. So for example, if you have legacy devices that are not capable of running the secure device SDKs or this Azure IoT Edge runtime that I've mentioned, we can still ensure security across the communication layer by means of something we call the Azure IoT Edge Gateway. And this offering allows for a variety of configurations that can aid in adapting to the types of environments that might exist within say manufacturing facilities, offshore or intermittent and remote environments, and even air-gapped internal networks that have no outbound internet access. And so we'll examine these configuration strategies and the type of environments they are best suited for in depth in that presentation. So the goal there is to leave you confident that Azure IoT services can be leveraged really in the most challenging environments, provided that you have knowledge of the patterns that can enable secure connectivity for your workloads. Now that we've explained how IoT solutions built on Microsoft SDKs and cloud services can ensure security within even the most challenging network environments, we can begin the conversation on how Azure IoT solutions might be relevant to your line of business and what those solutions would look like from an architectural perspective. So recent innovations have allowed for the proliferation of IoT solutions across numerous industries, and it's really not a surprise that much of that innovation has been iterative, meaning that we began with kind of this availability of nearly limitless compute and storage that was brought about via the cloud revolution. And this has allowed for vast expansion in the ability to operate and process data transmitted by devices at scale. In fact, we're now starting to see this come full circle as computing power is also increasing down on edge devices, and that's beginning to unlock new possibilities for small form factor edge devices to the point that it's now possible to run accelerated AI workloads, for example, things like object detection on devices not much larger than a cell phone. And as innovations in cloud increase, we start to see additional benefits. For example, with the adoption of things like Microsoft's digital twins, it's now possible to replicate physical environments into virtual space, allowing for one-to-one -one mappings of real world environments to cloud-backed solutions. We kind of refer to this paradigm as a digital transformation. We see really the potential of Internet of Things and AI at the edge solutions as the harbinger of mainstream AI. Again, this is, this is no longer a field that is inaccessible or riddled with complexity and cost. In fact, it's now more available than ever before and arguably has a learning curve that really invites all who possess the interest to get started with it. And we hope that we can inspire your line of business to seek the benefits of these types of solutions where they can make the most impact to your processes and of course, relevant customer experiences. Now you might be wondering, how does this make sense to the line of business that perhaps you're involved in? And the, the cross industry relevance of IoT solutions really pervades pretty much any industry that can benefit from increased value, reduced waste or enhanced procedures via the introduction of real-time insights and automated systems that react to those insights. For example, in recent times, many businesses are facing the effects of return to work in the face of the global COVID-19 outbreak, and they have a need to ensure the safety of employees and customers. So you've started to see this kind of proliferation of automated systems that can do things like screening and reporting of visitor well-being that are demonstrating the ability to mitigate uh, potentially the effects of contagious infection using IoT-based solutions at the, the heart. And within the medical community itself, the ability to monitor patients in real time is, of course, critical, especially during times of surge capacity that were experienced during the COVID-19 outbreak and also in helping to identify and properly assess patients that may be under quarantine. And this of course, you know, outside of pandemic situations can extend to things like smart blood sugar monitors or just telemedicine in general. Now, one of the use cases that a lot of us are familiar with is that futuristic vision of self-driving vehicles, which is at its heart also an IoT solution. In fact, one that, that very clearly demonstrates just how fast 
these insights can be enacted upon in edge solutions uh, to the point that vehicles can recognize potentially catastrophic events in real time. And this effect can, can be extended to, to other services, for example, things like smart factories to be able to reduce downtime by automating quality control systems that can ultimately allow for increased production and reduction in defects within the manufacturing facility. And similarly, um, energy companies can leverage IoT data to be able to do things like adapt to demand spikes by recognizing them as they happen, and even providing value downstream to customers by using the same data to perhaps automatically dial down HVAC usage during these critical time periods. And finally, in retail areas, it's possible to gauge customer behavior using IoT devices with a fidelity that can mirror that of what you would expect in online analytics, ultimately allowing you to provide enhanced customer experiences that can be brought about by doing things like reducing shelf vacancy, optimizing reorder frequencies, using things like AI to detect when the, the time is to do that, and also um, the potential to maybe offer product suggestions to customers in the moment based on demographic or interest data, or perhaps even how long they've spent in a specific location of the store. So as you've seen here, IoT solutions can really address a variety of different use cases. But what's interesting to note here is that in all of the examples provided, there's a commonality, that pathway from the device to the cloud, to the line of business is really similar across most IoT solutions. There, there are of course variations of the specific technologies involved when you encounter these solutions in the real world, but the workflow of using things or devices to capture and produce insights, which lead to action is common to all IoT solutions. And once you understand this fundamental concept, you can apply it to a host of business scenarios to create relevant IoT solutions that leverage those real-time insights being produced by your devices. And if we extend this concept a little bit further, uh, we could produce a common architecture for IoT solutions built on Microsoft Azure by employing service offerings designed specifically to address this common workflow. So in this, this modality, our things are really IoT devices which communicate using the secure Azure IoT device SDKs, either directly to an IoT hub or by means of an IoT Edge gateway. And once that data arrives to the Azure cloud, we can begin to process and operate on insights contained within using services like stream analytics that can allow you to filter relevant information while the data is in flight. And this allows us to extract time critical insights into what we call warm path, which makes it readily available for immediate use or offloading into cold storage for a different use case, potentially like archival purposes, or maybe even training a machine lear learning model. The key being that once our data is in the cloud, the scalable integration of that data into line of business applications enables the ability to take action on that data produced by our devices in the real world. So what exactly do these services on, from the aforementioned slide look like in practice? So we've kind of covered at this point some theoretical concepts and now we're gonna go ahead and show off how you can actually develop state-of-the-art AI at the edge uh, solutions utilizing the latest concepts in computer vision. And to demonstrate this, we're gonna go ahead and explore a real world project developed using NVIDIA embedded hardware and Azure IoT services to produce a generic solution that consumes multiple video sources to produce insights at the edge and in the cloud utilizing custom object detection models built with Microsoft AI services. So specifically, we will showcase uh, the development of a solution that targets an NVIDIA Jetson device that contains an onboard GPU for accelerated AI inferencing. And these are, these are small devices. I mean, it's, it's about half the size of the box that I'm holding in my hand. And they actually come with a pretty formidable uh, onboard GPU. And this is going to allow us to be able to do really interesting things. For example, uh, what we'll do is, is develop a custom object detection model utilizing the custom vision AI service from Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Cognitive Services. And from there, we'll explore how we can leverage things like Azure Streaming Analytics at the edge to filter out object detection data results, ultimately allowing us to reduce the data payload that we send up to the cloud. And once we have summarized data flowing into a backing Azure IoT hub service, we can visualize telemetry from that device in services like Time Series Insights or Power BI, allowing us a very easy visualization of the results that are coming off of our device in near real time.
Now, because the sol aforementioned solution is uh, built on Microsoft Azure, it's naturally aligned to the previously mentioned Azure I IoT reference architecture. So our device will be instrumented with the Azure IoT Edge runtime, which again will allow it for secure direct communication to an Azure IoT hub ingestion service. And on the device, we're going to employ custom object detection utilizing a model developed with cognitive services. And we're gonna supply those results to a streaming analytics service that will run on the device as what we call an IoT Edge module. This will provide us the ability to, to send filtered results from that streaming anal analytics module into an IoT hub, again, allowing us to be able to process that in visualization services like Time Series Insights and Power BI. So with that said, um, the following demo that I'm going to showcase here um, is actually available online. Uh, you can take this down for your own learning or even use this as a baseline for perhaps building a real solution in the real world. Um, all of this is available. In, it also comes with eight hours of live stream video content that shows us literally building the solution from the ground up. Now, that doesn't mean that it necessarily will take you an eight hour investment of time, but we do go into details there to give you that background information on these components. So you're not just following a recipe and not really understanding how it works. So with that said, I'll go ahead and kick off a playback of a video demonstration for everyone. And please let me know if there's any issues with audio when I go ahead and start this off. The following demo, Intelligent Video Analytics with NVIDIA Jetson and Microsoft Azure, is available on GitHub at aka.ms slash IoT50 slash Intelligent Video. This project can be reused for learning or may be re-implemented as a baseline for your own custom solutions. Let's get started. So right now, you're looking at a live feed of four simultaneous camera feeds that's also performing object detection inference in real time utilizing a model that was created in Custom Vision AI. Now this model is capable of detecting vehicles, people, as well as some of the pets that can be found around the home. And we're going to show you how you can take this solution and connect it with services of Microsoft Azure, for example, things like Time Series Insights or Microsoft Power BI, to be able to view telemetry from your devices in near real time. We'll start by checking out the services that make this up by looking at the resource group for our intelligent video analytics solution. And you might be surprised to notice that there's really only six services employed here, and technically, one of them is really just a connector for one of the other services. Let's go ahead and revisit our architecture diagram that we were looking at previously in the presentation. The way the solution begins is that we have a device, specifically an NVIDIA Jetson device, that's running something called the NVIDIA DeepStream SDK as an IoT Edge module. And this is because NVIDIA publishes the DeepStream SDK as a module in our Azure marketplace. You can go ahead and pull this down, configure it, point it at camera feeds, and then supply it with, in our case, a custom vision AI model to be able to perform inferencing in real time on your device and push those results into Azure IoT services. Once we get telemetry from that module, we then forward it to a streaming analytics job that's actually going to run on the device. And this will essentially act as a super filter because the telemetry is going to be coming at us very, very fast. In fact, if you look at our live feed, that box, the reason why you're not seeing it go away is because it's producing results that fast. Once we get our summarized results from that stream analytics job, those will then flow into our IoT hub. And this means we're not going to inundate it with every single detection, only the ones that matter the most to us. And we can tune that by modifying the stream analytics job down at the edge. Once the data appears in IoT hub, we can then take all telemetry flowing through it and forward it into a time series insights event connector where we can then visualize it in time series insights. Similarly, we can also take that same telemetry and forward it to a stream analytics job that's running in the cloud and then forward that to a Power BI report. And of course, all of this is surrounded by our custom object detection model that's deployed down to our device 
and leveraged by that DeepStream SDK module. Now, the part that we're going to start off with is how we're actually going to train that model utilizing a service that runs on the device that will allow us to capture samples and then forward those either to Azure Storage or directly into Custom Vision AI where they can be used for training. Let's take a quick look at the IoT Hub before we jump into that. Here you'll see the IoT Hub that backs our solution. And inside here, we can see that registered IoT Edge device. If we click on the device, you can see the deployment that has been applied. And you'll notice that there's six modules that are currently employed. There's the Edge Agent and Edge Hub, which are system modules that are part of the IoT Edge runtime, in addition to four custom modules. The first one that we're going to look at here is the camera tagging module. And this is what's going to allow us to obtain samples to tr train our object detection algorithm, utilizing samples captured directly from the environment. So if we visit port 3000 on our IoT Edge device, you'll notice here that we're presented with that camera capture module. And there's an interface here that allows you to specify a camera feed that you'd like to connect to. And from there, you can go ahead and capture samples. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and tag this one car. We'll give it a name, test002, and we'll go ahead and save it. Now, once we've saved that image, you'll see it comprised with a number of other images that we gathered earlier. And from here, we can either choose to upload those images directly into blob storage or into custom vision AI. And this is rather straightforward. For example, if I wanna push these into blob storage, you can either push to local, and this is useful for environments that don't have outbound internet access, and this will store those images locally, or we can push directly to a blob in Microsoft Azure. I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate pushing this directly to custom vision. Simply provide my endpoint, my training key, and then I can choose the project that I wanna apply it to and select push, and it's that easy. My new training samples are now part of my custom vision AI project. Now, when I gathered all the samples that you're seeing here, I actually gathered quite a few. I, I think it was 4,000 or so over a weekend. And I actually stored all of those into Microsoft Azure Storage. Now, that's an option that you can enable in this demo, and we won't cover that. But it's interesting to point out here that your data can arrive either in this cold storage area or directly in the Custom Vision AI where it can be utilized. From here, I gather a number of different samples taken at different times of day, also in different environment conditions. And this allows me to do things like be able to detect things at night as well as in the day. Once we've got enough samples, we can go ahead and train up our model and again, export that for use on our IoT device. Now, specifically what we're employing here is the Onyx model format. So once I've exported that, I can then configure that DeepStream module to leverage it pick it up and use it, and it'll begin detecting the objects that our model has been trained to detect. For more details on this, I'm going to include a resource at the end of our presentation that goes into a full deep dive on the Azure IoT Edge camera tagging module. Now, once we get that model up and running with the DeepStream SDK, it becomes important to filter those results because again, they're flowing at us extremely fast. And the way we're gonna do that is by using a stream analytics job that we deploy down to the edge. And it's interesting to note how this works. Here I've created a stream analytics query and I can go ahead and set it up to work with a storage account, just like the one we saw a moment ago. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new storage container called DeepStream Analytics. And here I can publish my actual job. And what this means is that our IoT Edge module will pull the job down from Azure and then run it locally on the device. Now, similarly, there's also another stream analytics job that we alluded to earlier. And this one's gonna allow us to forward our data into Power BI. There's a slight difference here. This particular stream analytics job lives in the cloud. So it's actually taking that telemetry from the IoT hub and then forwarding it into Power BI. And the way that it's accomplishing that, if we head to the output, there's a specific type of output that you can choose. In fact, Power BI is just one of many. You can go to an event hub, SQL database, data lake storage, table storage, service bus topic, queue, Cosmos DB, Azure Function, or Azure Synapse. 
And once we've got our data forwarded over there, we can begin to make use of it with Power BI reports, which we'll look at in just a moment. But first, we're going to show a quick software as a service offering known as Time Series Insights. And this is just one of the many visualization tools that you can use in Microsoft Azure. Once we forward that data over, the only thing that we have to do is model it by specifying a custom type. And once we do that, we can start to graph all of that telemetry through custom hierarchies that we've defined and know when we've detected various different objects throughout the home or when I've seen people specifically or perhaps vehicles in the yard. So let's go ahead and head back to that Power BI demonstration. So imagine that we have a custom Power BI report that we've created in Power BI Desktop. We can publish that report into the cloud. It's very straightforward to do that. And once you've done it, you can go ahead and begin to see your results within your Office 365 subscription. So I've already gone ahead and done that here by choosing my workspace. We'll select that and we'll go ahead and push it up. And once that goes into Power BI in the Microsoft Office 365 offering, I can then view that report or perhaps share it out with other individuals on the team. And this is great because I can easily see things at a glance. For example, you know, what kind of detections have happened at the home? Or perhaps, you know, when's the last time that you saw people? From here, we can go ahead and take this report and we can pin it to a live page. And once you've done that, you can start to view the telemetry coming off of your devices in real time. In fact, a vehicle just drove by and we can see here that our number of cars in the street is incremented to one. And similarly, if I was able to see some people, we'd see this graph start to light up with results. And we've also got some telemetry here that shows us some interesting things like the last time and place that the dog and cat were seen. Now, if you like this demonstration, we actually show you how to build this from the ground up using live streamed videos that show us building the entire solution from scratch. So if you want to follow along with this, you can head to the GitHub repo for the intelligent video analytics with NVIDIA Jetson and Microsoft Azure project. And you can watch those videos to discover this project, what it's like to build it for yourself, and hopefully learn all the skills needed in order to create your own custom intelligent video application. Excellent. So I hope that everyone was inspired by the demo that you just saw. And again, I will reiterate that it is available on GitHub. Uh, if you do have a uh, NVIDIA Jetson device of your own, you can go ahead and pull this down, begin working on it, and learn about all of the amazing uh, features and functionalities that were showcased in the presentation. Now, um, if you were to follow through all of those steps, um, you would essentially be teaching yourself how to apply the Azure IoT reference architecture to create a custom intelligent video solution that arguably could be adapted to address a variety of use cases. So for example, by modifying the type of object being detected and ensuring that we're capturing data that's relevant to the business, you could put your Azure IoT solution to work in almost any industry. In fact, Microsoft's own Project 15 is a project that was born from the same approach, producing a solution that assists in conservation and production of the Earth's elephant population by adapting the object detection model to detect, you guessed it, elephants, and updating the business integration components to visualize where they've been seen on an interactive map. You can learn more about this project by visiting aka.ms slash project 15. Now for links to relevant documentation, resources, and all demos used in this presentation, and the follow-up presentation that I've alluded to, you can check out aka.ms slash IoT50 slash resources. And if you're interested in perhaps using this presentation, the slide deck and or the video recording of, of literally a delivery that looks similar to this, um, you can pull that down for and use it for your own. Um, no need to contact us or anything. Uh, those materials can be found at aka.ms slash IoT50. And if you enjoyed this session and are interested in other topics covered in our All Up Internet of Things learning path, you can find all of our session resources at aka.ms slash IOTLP. I, I, I will do it. No, not like that. You can. Not like that. 
So we've covered quite a few topics in this session, and I'd like to share that we've curated a collection of modules on the Microsoft Learn platform that pertain to the topics seen in the session. And these can allow you to do things like interactively learn how to securely connect IoT devices to the cloud via the use of the aforementioned IoT Edge Gateway. Also how to build intelligent edge applications using Azure IoT Edge. How to also create solutions based on our software as a service offering known as Azure IoT Central. And finally, we cover details on how to implement the streaming analytics service both in the cloud and on the edge. And we would also like to add one final benefit of this presentation, literally the one you've just seen, and those associated learn modules are actually created um, to guide you on the path to official certification. So if you might be interested in obtaining an accreditation that could help you stand out as an official Microsoft Azure IoT developer, we recommend checking out the AZ220 certification. And you can find more details on the topics covered in that exam, as well as schedule an exam for yourself at aka.ms slash IoT50 slash certification. So with that said, um, if you're looking for any free interactive learning content on any Azure services or Microsoft technologies, I definitely can suggest heading over to microsoft.com slash learn, where you can start to begin by defining your own custom learning path with resources on the latest topics and trends in technology. So again, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending this presentation and we'll go ahead and open it up for Q&A. Thank you very much, Paul. That was fantastic, it literally boof. <laughs> there's a lot of content in it just in that demo all on its own um and it's like oh i want to try that i want to try that i want to try that i think um one of the one of the things with that we were alluding to it earlier the whole even just the, the microsoft iot space there and all the services you can attach to it i'm not sure there's a single iot dev that's done all of it <laughs> that touched a fair bit of it that one demo yeah, myself included. I, I don't think I've touched all the services. We're always coming out with new stuff. Um, even, even just in this domain, uh, one of the things we're working on right now is something called uh, live video analytics. It's, it's actually documented on, on uh, our Microsoft Docs that um, arguably this demo that I've shown you, they're, they're simplifying that even further with a new offering. So definitely something to check out if you find this, this realm of uh, intelligent video analytics interesting. That was great. Is there any uh, questions for, for Paul? You need to put your brains back in your heads. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, no, that was, that, was, that was really good, Paul. Thank you. Um, really interesting. I, I'm, I've certainly got some homework to do. Um, just just curious uh, about the, um, well, two questions. Uh, first one on, on the test kit. Um, I was doing a, a quick quick search on some of the NVIDIA test kits there are there is there any that you'd recommend for us to to get into it that you know um so one of the you know which jetson kit would would you use for someone who's who's just trying to get into it if you're just trying out um you know you, you just want to learn and and cost is a concern you want to kind of get in with like you know not breaking the bank the 69 dollar uh two gigabyte version of the jetson nano dev kit and this was just launched at nvidia's gtc event uh, i want to say a couple weeks ago or was that last week COVID time, it's hard to tell. Um, yeah. That's the easiest way to get in. There's also a $100 kit that might be more easy to find just because like this, those have been stocked on Amazon for you know over a year now. Um, it's going to cost you a little bit more, $100, but give you a bit more performance at um, four gigabytes. And there's also the, uh, if you want to go like big, there's the Jetson Xavier NX. And I forget the price on this one. I want to say it's like $399 but it's like 10 X the power of the Jetson nano. So again, if you want to do like the show stopping, like uh, again, the 30, the, the four streams that you saw me processing, I was doing on a two gig model. So, so literally that entry level could show you do everything I just showed. But if you want to do crazy stuff, like 32 simultaneous feeds, the NX more expensive model might be the way to go. So it depends on what you want to do really and how much you want to spend. Yeah. Well, the first thing I want to do is follow what you did. Because you know, uh, imitation and all that is a, is a really, really good way of learning. And I, I, I'm there's a lot there which I want to learn. And I'm really grateful for the fact that you've got a whole series of videos that can walk us through it. And that's 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 really attractive. Um, the, the other question is is slight, slightly different, uh, more less about IoT, more about the video analytics. 
Um, have um, has any work been done around things like face tracking and sentiment analysis, things like that? Have you, you done any kind of recognition work on that? So that's certainly something you can employ. And again, like our own cognitive services does allow for that ability to take an image and be able to detect. Um, I know there's a solution out there. It's actually a startup based out here in Houston, Texas, um, named Zenus, like Z-E-N-U-S. Mm-hmm. And they're literally doing exactly that, where it's live video analytics, where not only is it the counting of people, and they're, they're primarily in the event space, just to be clear about that. It's like, you know, you... You think about like when we used to go to conferences and things like that, it would be a service for that, but also for brick and mortar businesses and things like that. And what they do, they not only like count people and, you know, are able to give you analytics on like, you know, these were the hot times and things like that. They also do the sentiment analysis at the same time, and they are using NVIDIA hardware behind the scenes to accomplish that. Um, And so they can do things like tell, you know, when the most people were in there and also when people were the most upset or the most happy during whatever your event is and where it's been located. Would you see them doing that for for calls like this? Where you think we tune in and then at the end of it, you say like, what was the general sentiment of the meeting? I'm just just saying like you could hook out. That is some 1984 (laughs) uh, stuff, but what's stopping that? Really, what is? I mean, you know, We've got this live, this this very meeting right now, right, is live streaming off to YouTube. There's nothing to say we throw that at some other endpoint that's running some sentiment analysis. And, exactly. And you can start to gauge. And, like, where that becomes really interesting is think about online learning with um, universities and stuff like that. Like, were the students engaged or were they pissed <laughs> off, you know, <laughs> and sad? Were they were they sad when you gave them their grades? You can now measure that, which is, which is interesting, scary at the same time. So, of course, I want to mention, you know, any of these ty- types of solutions, if you are going to build them, please be ethical about it. We, we, we tend to, to, yeah. to adopt those principles at Microsoft or any of our solutions, but uh, you are definitely hitting on some, some really interesting and, and possibly controversial topics there. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got... Oh, go on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I've got a question. Um, great project. I mean, thank you for yourself and all the resources that put that together. It's it's actually quite impressive using those cognitive services to, you know, get that that in, sort of insight. Um, I was wondering about um, night vision in terms of like it, the cognitive services. Did you find that there were some challenges with night vision versus daylight? And, and then the second part of that question is, um, what type of cameras were you actually using? Is that documented in, in, the, in the documentation? Uh, both great questions. And coincidentally, I'm prepared to answer that with another box. Um, so uh, the first one on the, uh, the night vision. So what I found when I trained these models, I primarily used only samples that were gathered during the day. And I, and I mentioned this like in a split second in the video playback demo. I said, like, I also took pictures at night so that it would work at night. Um, there, there's, there's twofold to that. One, one way to solve that is for night vision. If you're using a night vision camera, you want to use one that's ample enough to give you good enough visualization. Now, usually the way those work, this, the way this one works, the Foscam FI9821P. Um, I'll try to get that model number in the window there. Uh, this one does an okay job of it. I wouldn't say it's the greatest. I, I do get color dropout whenever I do that. And I, I, I've, I'm not, no one knows how these algorithms work underneath the hood. It's a black box, but I have a feeling that if there's color, it helps it. Um, because what happens is things start to kind of look the same. So what I did to accomplish that for my uh, solution was I took a lot of samples at night. And then what you see in practice, like in more of the production types of scenarios, what folks are doing is they'll, you know, First off, when they employ these things like outside, they'll do it in some sort of way where they can control the lighting conditions, often rather drastically, like, you know, spotlight pointed down at the site of interest. Right, right. And of course, in most implementations, these would be hopefully in a factory and hopefully factories are indoors. So you don't have the same issues or you can control the environment a bit better, but it's real. And in fact, it's one of the things I wish it was called out a bit more in some of the like introductory materials for object detection, because you don't think of that. Uh, you, you go in thinking like, oh, it'll always detect people. I trained it on people. No, it, it actually depends hugely on the environmental factors with which that model was trained against and the conditions of 
the source samples that you are gathering from your device in real time. Right. Right. It's, it's almost kind of like a, you know, I feel like you don't, y'all don't talk about that because it's like it's like security and IoT. It is the elephant in the room. Um, but for regarding the the devices, this this camera, what I liked about these and the reason I I went with them is I already had Foscam around my house. Whether that is a consequence of they happen to be uh, this is purely coincidental. They were at one point headquartered in Houston. So I saw these things all the time and like, that's just where I would get them. And this model I want to say is like $30 on Amazon or even cheaper. I, I ordered mine on eBay, uh, just kind of restocked merchandise. You can get them for 25 bucks or so. Okay. And all of the cameras that were in that feed were Foscam brand, a couple of them, different models that are more rated for outdoor use. But if you want to get rocking and rolling with these, um, yeah, the, the Foscam, you know, brand does work here. And those were the ones we used in the video. Of course, any RTSP capable camera should work with the underlying, um, I guess we were using the deep stream module there. It's worked on every RTSP stream I've thrown at it. And that that is saying something I, I tested pretty exhaustively. So I'd say it probably works with most cameras that expose an RTSP substream. Okay. And, and regarding the models, um, you know, I know you have to sort of provide it with samples. Are we talking about, um, in your particular case, was it like hundreds, thousands in, in terms of either vehicle um, recognition or versus people recognition? And then a uh, second part of this question is in terms of, I noticed that you actually had a sidewalk on the other side. Is it capable of determining if there's people walking along that sidewalk? Uh, so to answer the second question really quick, yes. Um, in fact, like any of the samples that I'm giving from any of the locations are arguably helping to train that object detection for any of the cameras. Okay. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a case of overlearning in this case. And, and that is because, to answer your first question, I started with, so, so believe it or not, that camera tagging module that was showed off can be uh, automated with calls to direct methods. So I wrote a quick bash script that would just round robin my cameras in every 15 seconds for a weekend. Okay. Uh, which was great because it rained during that weekend. I got all sorts of great environmental samples. Uh, I captured 4,000 in total, which I then distilled down to like, which ones are actually good, you know, and, and you know, the interesting ones, like when the mailman was delivering mail and stuff like that. Um, once I distilled that down, um, I found, I think my current model runs at 150 trained images per object. And there's four objects there. There's the cat, the dog, people, and vehicles. And the reason why you want more, like more samples is always better. In fact, if I could get this up to a thousand, it'd be scarily accurate. The, the reason you want that is when cognitive services trains your, your models, um, it actually slices them up based on the lowest amount of sampled samples for an object. So let's say I have like a hundred for a cat, but I have 150 for a car. It's gonna use that hundred for the cat when it slices the models up, it's really only going to, it, it then takes out 25% of those. So you would have 75 samples, even though I had a total of 100 for the car. So answering a question you didn't quite ask here, but not only do you have to gather a lot of samples, but that increases um, by dimensionality, depending on how many objects you actually want to detect. So if you want 100 samples of one thing, you better get 100 of the other. And getting 100 samples of a cat is, is challenging. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, did, is that is yours? Is that documented? Did you sort of blog about that, or is that just um, is like that experimentation? And Thanks, that sort Dave. Of that is a great. You know what? That is a great topic for the uh, IoT tech community. I think really digging into that because uh, no, it's it's not. In fact, it's something even even it's something I kind of learned by accident because. Yeah. You look at the output of cognitive services and it would tell you like, hey, I use this many samples. Yeah, I know because actually I'm, I'm experimenting with a, a camera and I know um, it's, it's, it's a retail camera and I know they're using Azure services and it has cognitive services built into it. It keeps on going off when even a moth uh, oh. flies by and says that it's a person. So, you know, I understand even things that are in production are having a hard time sort of just coming up with the proper models and the detection. Um, okay, I won't take up too much more of your time. I just want have one more question. Um, regarding the time series insights, um, I know that's an expense, you know, it's a great service because it can do, you know, live real-time streaming of millions of, uh, of telemetry uh, actions, but it's expensive. 
Um, it can be expensive. I'm just curious, do you have that running full time? And did you actually like, you know, give me an estimate in terms of what your monthly cost would be to have a consumer do something like this? Let me look at the billing for that. I've not looked at that particular service in depth, but I'm bringing it up right now. I can tell you that it's, it's not that expensive. Um, and part of that is you, you can also tune this down. So um, I enabled uh, warm path uh, capabilities on my instance, that's going to make it more expensive. Number one. Um, the other one is uh, to reduce the cost. There's actually a pay as you go offering and that. That's the one that like significantly brings it down in terms of, uh, so there's, there's other instances like the S one and S two instances, which, which do some cool things like they'll auto um, determine your schema of data that you're sending to it. Um, and that becomes a manual process when you use the pay as you go. Um, however, um, that said, it's it's not that bad. So I'm trying to look here, um, going through the breakdown of my my services, uh, resource group name. Oh gosh, I have too many here. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. You know, actually, if if you want to just DM me, uh, you know, just if you have that time to look it up, that'd be great. I don't want to. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems like I'm in the wrong. Oh yeah, I'm in the wrong scope right now. Um, so as soon as I can uh, switch off, get into the right subscription. Let's see. Uh, but I I. I I don't know. I don't want to ballpark it and be wrong, but like, it's not going to blow you out. Like it's not going to go into the multiple hundreds. It, it, you know, it's, it's less than that. So, uh, but good question nonetheless, that and one that does certainly come up. Yeah. But I also it depends on, uh, on the number of events that are being streamed. Right. So I, I evidently it, maybe it's not that much as, as much as I was thinking, because, you know, some of the prototypes I've worked on is it was immense, but that's because it was, a lot, thousands and thousands of, of messages per, per minute or, you know, so um, anyways. And it's also optional. You can, um, you know, I said there was another way to get it into Power BI and the Power BI cost is $25 per month. Although you got to have the M365 subscription behind it. So you can pull some of these pieces out too, if there's cost concerns with, with some right. of the stuff. Right, right. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Any other questions? Hi, Paul, you mentioned that other people could take these um, resources and, and run them themselves as, as their own talks or something along those lines. What was that you were talking about? Yeah, so um, let me go ahead and share screen real quick here. Uh, again, on the resource links that I provided at the end, those will kind of get you there to the, um, to the bigger project, if you will. And that bigger project is called the Internet of Things Learning Path. So uh, that is a, sorry, wrong project. Uh, that is a project on, bring my, uh, on GitHub. So that's at aka.ms slash IOTLP. That's also written up on the tech community blog if you're familiar with that. Um, you can literally come here, get clone, and get recordings of the presentation you just saw, um, the slide decks for the presentation you just saw. And there's actually four other complete sessions that go into other topics in almost the same level of detail. Um, in fact, what you saw was just an introduction. So the the, the deeper ones go a lot more uh, into detail, cover things like you know using um, databases and things like that for backing the IoT telemetry data, uh, utilizing artificial intelligence. And this one is really cool. I highly recommend that one. Um, deciphering data. Again, this is a topic you don't usually see our um, uh, you know, folks go into detail on in a presentation. Again, that's captured here, as well as uh, an introductory session that will teach you all about the base services, in addition to walking you through some of the learned content uh, that's relevant to uh, these sessions. So you put them all together. Um, hopefully our, our intent is that you walk away knowing everything about Azure IoT solutioning. And again, these are all built on top of learn modules and associated Microsoft Learn content. That's fantastic. Uh, looks like I've lost the rest of my life for the next few weeks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's fully. What sort of hardware do you need to run through? Obviously, you've mentioned the, the Nano there. Um, can you do it all without any hardware? Or I would say that every other section uh, does not require a particular piece of hardware. Uh, only mine did in that last piece with the uh, the Jetsa piece, if you wanted to replicate that particular component, uh, but everything else is device agnostic. Hmm. Obviously you're gonna need an Azure subscription and um, uh, there's, there's, what is it, $200 free if you sign up, I think on Azure, so you, that probably would cover 
um, people if they didn't have an Azure. I mean, if, what are you doing without an Azure subscription anyway? But um, if you've not got one, then you can probably do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's uh, that's really all you need. If you have an Azure subscription, you can follow along. And again, there's ways to obtain those if you're a student, if you're wanting to sample it, etc. cetera. Um, or if you have a, you know, if you happen to be, uh, have, a, have a, what do we call that now? The the equivalent of the old uh, MSDN. Uh, uh, so visualstudio.com license or something now, isn't it? I think that's where you get your benefits now is on that particular. Yes, yeah, so that would be another <laughs> avenue as well. Yeah. Oh, you know, do loads of work and become an MVP and you throw money at you there as well in the form of Azure <laughs> Credit. So <laughs> I'd be lost without that uh, Azure <laughs> Credits, actually. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, it's regarding a certification, uh, which you talked about, Paul, uh, easy uh, 220, I think it's for IoT certification. Uh, is there any uh, official uh, 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 kind of a tush, like a uh, to, like uh, the tutorlet from the Microsoft, which we have for AZ900, we have the similar uh, like a session like every month or something so that you can register and do, there's a live session and then we'll get uh, uh, like, they'll like guide everything how to uh, like uh, overview and all. Uh, because uh, I looked into the certification, uh, the contents and sometimes uh, the, the documentation uh, it's like uh, some. It, it's, if, if you don't do practically all the things, we it's, it's sometimes it's a bit harder. So, is there uh, something the Microsoft is officially doing? Yes. So we actually gathered a lot of these resources back in July for something we call July OT. So if you head to this link I just put in the chat, aka.ms/julyot, okay. I'll go ahead and share my screen again. Um, the very, very top portion, we actually, during that month, we went through these kind of, uh, how do I say, um, themes for each week. And um, within here, the very first one at the top, you'll see is gonna be focused on online learning and certification. This would be the collection of resources. I definitely would go with the MS Learn IoT learning resources on learn. Um, in addition, this AZ220 study group that's offered by Diana Phillips over on the OCP team is fantastic. It sounds almost exactly like what you're talking about, that live um, format where you can sort of learn. And I don't know um, the details on this just yet, but I think something's coming in December. Okay. I think uh, I won't, I can't, I can't say anything more about it other than we're going to very much be providing resources in December to assist people in obtaining certification. Read through that however you will. Again, I said, we will provide something at no cost to facilitate your obtaining of an AZ220 certification. I think I said it without actually saying it. There we go. <laughs> okay. I'm also you, working on a Pluralsight course for AZ220, uh, which is coming out at a similar time uh, in December, theoretically. I, I won't be doing all of it, but it's a certification prep uh, course for AZ220 concentrating on the topics that are in the exam. Um, I'm not sure if there's an overlap between what Paul's just said and what I've just said. Um, actually, I'm hoping there isn't in some ways, or it depends on how the funding works for, for that. <laughs> but I, I don't think the two things are related. I'm just putting two and two together and coming up with uh, IoT. Could, could be a boost for an early Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that the free courses don't fund authors. Uh, so that would be bad for me, uh, normally anyway, but uh, this is, I, I doubt it's, that's what I was talking about. I'll tell you this, it's nothing like that. What it is would certainly uh, be synergistic to your efforts, Pete, and I can't wait till those get done. I, I, I think it's something, uh, you know, I'll even try to see if we can't get that featured on the Tech Community blog and really get it out there in front of folks. That's, that's easy. Amazing. We'll make that happen. Oh, fantastic. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, you, you'll forgive me. I'm looking. I've just got this new mic, and it's on my desk at the moment because I'm waiting for the arm. And I've got all of the speakers down here. And obviously, Paul, he's spotlighted at the top of the mic. <laughs> but I'm constantly looking around this bloody thing. I'm looking forward to getting the arm, getting moving it out of the way. <laughs> that was really good. And obviously, a, um, a, a round of applause to both our speakers. It was uh, 
uh, fantastic to have you both along. The content was was amazing, and uh, yeah, to um, to actually some overlap, a little bit of overlap in between those two as well. I think so. Uh, that was, yeah, it wasn't planned, but it was it was good to see. <laughs> Well, and one thing too, uh, Davide, like I'd love to connect you with some of the folks I work with. Believe it or not, my, my manager actually runs our spatial uh, mixed reality team in addition to IoT. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Uh, so like, and there's there's a reason he's doing both of those. There's just got to be. So uh, we'd love to <laughs> continue some conversations. Yes, that. definitely. Definitely. Great presentation, Paul. Likewise. Excellent. I'm going to have to watch both of those back again, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And take some more in and then go and watch the rest of that stuff um yeah awesomeness um we're, we're, i'm going to be sticking around here for a little bit longer for conversations and might even go and get myself a glass of wine um obviously if you want to disappear off then by all means do but if you want to stick around and and have a chat then uh, you're you're more than welcome i know um uh, davide at least you're in london so you're on our same time time zone but i know paul his eight hours behind so it may have skipped lunch to to give this part of the talk. <laughs> yeah. so, um by all means you don't you don't need to stay around if you don't need to paul and i know you said you've got a meeting to, to zip off to as well so um yeah by all means i think i can stay on here for another seven minutes or so just in case there's anything <laughs> seven minutes especially if this is just going to open up and be fun time too i mean i don't it's not like any of us are talking to people these days i mean no. so i mean <laughs> I, I take this as an enjoyable work moment right now <laughs> <laughs> and um paul what have, what have you got um on the calendar for for iot stuff that you can tell us about that's coming Obviously, there's going to be stuff that you can't tell us about, but is there any stuff that, that's going to be new? I know they're doing things, little things like plug and play and Azure Digital Twins, which is really cool at the moment. Um, and you're renaming Azure Security Center to IoT Defender and stuff like that. But So uh, really interesting that you mentioned Azure Digital Twins. I think there's going to be interactive content landing on Learn as early as the end of this month. Mm -hmm. um, which would be really cool um, just from, I know a lot of the feedback we get on that is, you know, it's obviously gone through some changes. Um, and by the way, those have been good. Like, like I think the product started in one direction and then there was a lot of feedback that came in from the communities that's ultimately allowed them to enhance it to where it is today. And the good news is that with that maturity, I think also the training materials that will supplement that will be a less, uh, let's say enigmatic than they were before and a lot more uh, tried and true to the point. So I definitely would be on the lookout for that. Um, also, I know a, a bunch of skilling initiatives coming up in December. Again, I, I sort of alluded to those, um, but I think there's going to be an all up sort of um, movement around, you know, again, a lot of this feeds through the learn modules and content, but uh, in encouraging folks out there to dive into the net new ways of learning about our products through these interactive modules on learn that's there's going to be more pushes for that and um we've, we've been toying with this idea this one is, is not materialized at this point but uh, we call it the unnamed iot event we'd love to, we don't know what it's going to look like who it's going to be for who's going to be the speakers but um the plan is hopefully to maybe work alongside some of our uh, mvps or just community speakers in various different locales to put on something for us, you know, for the topics that we're specifically interested in, because, you know, as you've seen with things like Ignite, sometimes uh, concept, content like IoT, it's there, right? But it sort of get, doesn't get pushed to the top. And we wanted to do something that's really just IoT focused. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> I like the sound of that. <laughs> so certainly yeah, something, I'll, and I'll take problem. this as, as good feedback back to the team. Yeah. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. No, I was gonna say um, the the deep dives that uh, Pamela Cortez has um, been hosting, that's a great, those are great resources, you know, because she's focused on the IoT. Those have been, I mean, I hands, you know, hands up and big clap to all of you advocates and Microsoft for pushing the IoT space and the great work you've done over the years. Um, you know, it's so inspirational and it's just, you know, keep up the great work. Um, but Pamela is a great person to follow and they, she's got, you know, just she just had one yesterday on sustainability and she had an interview with um, a VP, I don't remember what his name was, uh, regarding just, you know, sort of Microsoft's um, 
stance on sustainability and some of the devices, some of the technology that they're using. So it's available on demand and she's going to have a whole series of other um, deep dives coming up. Can you, can you if share I a link find, on If that I can find the link, I'll, I'll post it in the chat. Uh, I, 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 I imagine everyone else knows where where to get it, except for me. Yeah. <laughs> so so if, you, if you search up the IoT show, um, but they're on, they're on Channel 9 and, and they tend to get posted on there as well. Uh, there's a, a YouTube channel for Microsoft develop, um, IoT developers as well, I think. But yeah, if, if Dave's going to share the link, that's great. I think Olivia's, Olivia's got a new show as well, hasn't he, coming out? Or I saw him, there's a teaser he's just released on on Twitter. I'm not sure what. I didn't. Know, I think it was like while this was on, so I've not had a chance to to see. Uh, so, so Pamela's link is on the tech community. I just provided that here, and uh, it's updated weekly, which is awesome. In fact, yeah, she just had one yesterday. There's another one coming up on the 21st or 28th. Right. Um, and answer your your uh, Charles. You sort of alluded to this, like the one stop place where everybody's trying to communicate would be the tech community site. So where that's going to link you off to. Um, that's where we try mm -hmm. to keep everything. It doesn't mean we always do the greatest job. Like sometimes things slip out and don't find their way there, but we're, we're, we are pretty tight on it recently. And uh, that's where we're going to continue to drive things. So if you do want to know about upcoming things and events, the IOT tech community is definitely the, the place to go. Dev yeah, seems thanks. to be used quite a lot as well, doesn't it? Um, uh, there's quite a few people put stuff on there. Typically, Sorry, yeah, and it's like our third-party facing uh, blog content. So usually when we go off on a deep end where the product group might be a little upset that we're really kicking the tires, that stuff goes to death too. Yeah, I think Benjamin, is, uh, he put stuff on there. I think he was talking about that last month. And sometimes sometimes PG enjoys that stuff. I know there's sometimes I'll pick these things up and go, what the hell are y'all doing? This is awesome. We didn't think about this. Yeah. Uh, it's the experimental grounds, if you will. Yeah. I picked up a couple of those uh, digital twins um, MS Learn modules and live streamed them uh, <laughs> on Twitch uh, and broke a couple of things and had to feed them back. But I think some of it was how I um, how I was doing it. Uh, but really good interaction actually because when I did break it, I tweeted about breaking it and then I raised a bug and somebody from Microsoft jumped on a Teams call with me and we diagnosed what the problem was and. A guy called Bobby, who's a really good guy, actually. Uh, I think he joined last month's meetup, actually. Um, uh, so that was, it was really good. It, I think that's one of the things I like about the IoT team in general is the the fact that you're all very approachable and uh, communication's great and seems to be one of the more fun teams. So you know, everybody seems quite lighthearted and enjoying what they're doing. And um, yeah, it sounds, sounds quite good. I, I've not had any experience, much experience with the other teams I know there's, there's a VRAR type team, isn't there, David A at, at Microsoft as well? And yes, yes, of course. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I know that they're quite communicative. They are, they are all great guys. Mm. Uh, well, folks, I'm going to jump off. I do need to grab a snack before this next call, but it really has been a pleasure. Um, I don't know how we can continue to do this. You know, sometimes I wonder: do we really need to have these? Uh, presentation sometimes i i'd like to get on meetings with some of the fun folks that we meet out in our communities and things like that and just i don't know i guess open conversation it's just not enough of that happening so again it's a pleasure and and would love to be back anytime pete yeah absolutely you're always yeah. more than welcome and, and get in touch about your iot unnamed iot event and I'll have a chat whenever you're ready about that as well. That'd be cool to talk. Well, to I would love, love to talk to you about uh, your finds at flea markets, some of the retro <laughs> yes, computing that. games that you've found. That, that's amazing uh, stuff. You want to see my loft, Paul? It's just full of retro gear. Um, I'll take you on a tour of that once I've installed everything up onto shelves rather than it being on the floor at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, I, I especially I, love stuff when it's in another locale. Like, yes. yes. I I'd, be your be I'd be embarrassed to show you what's behind this door here on shelves. <laughs> <laughs> there's a museum in this room. There's a museum downstairs. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> hey, we better let you go, Paul. Uh, All right. Um, My see you later. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was that. I'm going to stop live streaming on YouTube now um, so that people can.